Our interview today is with Mrs. Ora Carr and Mr. James Campbell. Uh, today is February the 8th, 2006. We are at the Mortal Library, and we thank you, Ms. J Ms. Carr and Mr. Campbell, for coming today to tell us about uh, life in Mooresville and some of the experiences that you have had as, as residents of Mooresville. I can I'll iterate what Ms. Brown has said. Thank you for coming. And we really appreciate your time uh, that you have given us today on this oral history interview. We have a Winnie Cooper Center in Lawrenceville. And as I understand that you all work to help do lots of things to get different avenues available for our black citizens in Lawrenceville. Can you tell us a little bit about Winnie Cooper and how the Winnie Hooper Center became Winnie Hooper Center. Well, I, I think I'll have to go back a bit farther because Winnie Hooper started as a kindergarten teacher. She opened it, uh, started a kindergarten here in Mooresville. And that was when I was a child. And she would pick us up or walk us to the old community center that was on Neal Street. And she continued to work with, with the children of the community, well, of the whole area in Mooresville. And there would be summer programs. I don't, I'm not just sure how these were funded, but she did much of this on her own, wouldn't you say, Mr. Campbell? Yes. Well, did she, from that, did she work in the public schools, or was it entirely private? It was, uh, initially, it was all private. I don't believe she ever worked in the schools. She just really worked in the community and with the Recreation Commission. And from that, from her work, the center was named, or how did that get to be uh, 100%? Well, it was from her work, partly, but uh, years after the time she's talking about, the city built a community building, uh, recreation center, you might say. I had a part in that. That was where I came in. I was the president of the uh, organization that was getting up the money. Mm -hmm. And we raised money t to put that building down there. And I always say we got gypped. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> because we raised, I forgot now how many thousand dollars told us to raise to put in the building. And I never believed that they put the money in the building. Uh, when they built the project down there, the company that built the project built that building. And I don't think any of our money went in it. Now, I, I could be wrong, but I tried, searched everywhere, and I couldn't find where any of it went in there. But that's all right. We got the building. And, uh, uh, what are some of the things that that, are, are, that building is used for today? How's that? How is the Winnie Hooper Center used today? Oh, it's, it's, it's a recreation center for the town of Morton. Uh -huh. And where it got its name, you ask, it was because of the things that she did for the town of Morton. And also, she was, the, she was over that building for a long time, wasn't she? Yes. Yes. And she she worked there as long as she was able, and they felt that she was due that honor. She was a very nice person. Well, one of the ladies on the school board now is the director of that center, and I think she has many, many programs for the young people today, yeah. and it's being so very effective in our community. Yes, lots of, lots she, she really loved young people. And she did everything she could for them. And I believe now um, there's an afternoon program for teenagers there. Um, and perhaps an evening program from time to time. 
but uh, it's also used for adult classes. Mm -hmm. um, go there and work on your uh, to get your GED. And I believe uh, Miss Johnson, who is over it now, also teaches computer classes. And and the senior citizens have an organization that meets there maybe a couple of times a week. That's very good. Ms. Hart, I know you're on the Housing Authority. Can you tell us about what your work is with the Housing Authority? Well, um, with this organization, initially we hardly knew which way we were going. But um, then we got together and decided that in order to get started, we needed to work in groups. And our uh, responsibility is to help families um, who have difficulty or low-income low families own their own homes. Um, but we felt that in order for them to be successful homeowners, they really needed to learn to manage their finances first. So since I was working with the Education Committee, that was one of the first things we did, develop um, a, a program for the potential buyers of homes to learn how to handle their monies. So we wrote, up, we wrote this program up, and it was approved by the uh, district person who was in Concord at, at that time. However, this was not being done anywhere. This was not being done anywhere. Um, it was first done by us. And the, the people in the, the, the members of the first classes were not able to buy homes here because at that time we did not have any homes built or even under construction. So they uh, bought homes in Concord, in the Concord, Cabarrus area, or Rowan County, or anyway, someplace else. But um, many people may not know that after we started this, and it was successful, it took on across the state and across the nation. What time frame are you talking about when this was begun? Uh, it was somewhere near ni 1997. That's when we we started um, doing this. And we have homes now? In the homes, homes community. yes. Community. Yes, uh, the Cascade Estate and the houses um, on Brookwood across mm -hmm. the street from what used to be Cascade Mills. That community has really revived itself. It has. It really does look nice in that area. But um, there are people who perhaps would never mm -hmm. have purchased a home, who have nice homes, and, and they seem happy. And, you're, and we're happy for them. Is this still an ongoing project where you're helping yes. people as, as you yes. see that they are? Yes. It's, uh, we have no intention of quitting, <laughs> even when I'm not there, but um, it's necessary to, uh, for individuals who want to be homeowners mm -hmm. to have help sometime in understanding uh, the different things, the different uh, needs that they have in order to purchase and maintain. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it goes beyond that 
um, they are given some instruction about um, the care of the home and repairs to the home. This is a federal program as opposed to a state program. Well, or is it a little? Above a little I would say a little of both. Money's come in from, from both, both sources, and and okay. also from private. Private. How about the town of Mooresville? Does it? Yes, Mooresville is a a huge contributor, or it was initially. Uh huh. To get it off the ground. Get, yes. Well, turning back a little bit in time. One of the things that I think that as people look at the history films later on, they will want to know a little bit about how it was during childhood. What kind of toys did you all have? Did you have free time? Uh, what did you do on Sunday? How was, how was your Sunday spent or how was school? So if you don't mind to expand a little bit on that, uh, how it was growing up. Oh, it was... For me, it was great. <laughs> I knew that my family wasn't rich, but um, neither did we consider ourselves poor. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have much money, I knew that. But there were other uh, things that we had to do. Um, Sunday was for religious activities. You went to church Sunday. Sunday school, you morning to worship, and if there were an afternoon program, you went to that, and you went to evening service. So Sunday was really dedicated uh, to religious activities, and sometimes uh, some other churches in the community would have a program, and if, if your church didn't have one, you would do that. So, um, you, you were just busy on Sunday. Um, toys. We, we had um, toys. That I think I know I, I've had the toys that I wanted. Not all of them, but I would get something that I wanted. And um, I was happy about that. Um, I liked reading uh, uh, a lot, so books, books, books. So, stood you in good stead as a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Mr. Campbell? How was it for you? On Sunday. Yes. <coughs> we had to go to Sunday school every Sunday, and as you can see here, mm -hmm. I went to church. I didn't have no shoes. But I went anyway. See, I was a red big boy barefooted. <laughs> and, but uh, so uh, yeah, if you lived in our house, you had to go to church. That was the rules there. And we had three services a Sunday. Had preaching morning, noon, and night. Mm -hmm. And after preaching, I had to walk about a mile and a half below the cotton mill here home mm -hmm. when I was six years old. And, and what church did you attend, Ms. Carl? I attended yeah. Watkins Chapel in Zion Church, where I'm still a member. And where is that located? Uh, it's located uh, on Statesville Avenue. Our church is the one next to Dunbar School down there. My, <clears throat> my grandfather was the founder of that church after slavery. He came to Mooresville, joined her church up there, Watkins Chapel, and uh, he didn't like having elders and bishops and things over him. He said, I just come out of slavery and I'm not going back in it. <laughs> and he, <laughs> He started a Baptist church down there. That was the beginning of our church. And uh, years later, they named it after me. That's it about four years ago. But uh, speaking of when I was a little boy, 
we had it rough, very rough. I, I was raised on the farm, and we didn't get to go to school, but about from three to four months out of the year, we had to stay there and wait. Now, the white children on the farm went to school, but the black didn't. They said we didn't need no education, that you need to work. And my father didn't know any better than this, let us stay there and work. But when I was around approximately eight or nine years old, we moved to Morrisville. Then we could go to school every day. And where did you go to school? The Moors with the Moors of Junction, mm -hmm. and uh, I tried to draw a picture of that thing last night, but I couldn't get it straightened out enough to bring it over here. Well, we need we need to qualify for this. that. Uh, that building was two rooms downstairs and two rooms upstairs, mm -hmm. and the front was about that high off the ground. The back was about that high, mm -hmm. and uh, we would play under the building. The rainy days, we'd get on there and shoot marbles and oh. wrestle under the building. You couldn't exactly stand up under that, but we could play. And the boys always went under the school to play. So, I had, excuse me, Mr. Campbell, some people may not know where the junction is. Uh, can you tell us where the junction is today? Well, that's uh, upstate for Avenue. Back in those days, there was a big old water tank out there where the train got water. That's gone now. And uh, there were several things there that's not there now. It doesn't look like State for Avenue. One time there was a sawmill up there years ago, way back when I was small. We need to qualify that Mr. Mr. Campbell is quite a bit older than Ms. Carr. Mr. Mr. Campbell, how old are you? Oh, I'm not but 97. 97. <laughs> 97. So he's talking about a time frame that's much, much longer ago than what Ms. Carr was talking about, correct? That's correct. <laughs> yeah, I was talking back before she was born. As far as toys, and I go back to that because lots of times children identify with the things that they have or have read about. What were some of the toys that you had during that time? Well, up. we didn't get very many toys. My daddy was kind of a handyman, and he made the stuff for us to play with. And also, he taught us to make things. Mm -hmm. So we would make about everything we played with. We, we, we did what you call rolling a hoop and paddle. I don't know where you all knew anything about that or not, did you? No, no. No hoop and paddle? I don't. I don't. <laughs> You take a stick and nail another stick across the bottom of it and get your wheel and you guide it with that stick and you run behind it. So that's quite good exercise and playing too. We'd run behind that thing all day. We'd take a little duck that they had discarded and we'd take all the top off and just have the frame and the wheel and we'd get on a big hill and get on crowd over and get on that old buggy and go down the hill. When you get to the bottom, we didn't have no way to stop it, so we just fall off. <laughs> we were rough little boys, <laughs> but we had a good time, and on Christmas we got a big stick of candy, a red stick of candy, and, and a horn, a big old cardboard horn, and that was Santa Claus, and we got a few oranges in there. We didn't get anything like oranges until Christmas. We didn't see nothing like that. But uh, we got oranges for Christmas. And of course, we got plenty of cake, because Mom would bake uh, approximately eight or ten cakes for Christmas. Give you all the cake you wanted. <laughs> I bet they were good, too. Yeah, they were. <laughs> I wish I could get a slice of it now. But after I <clears throat> grew up, I found out we had a much better time than children are having now. We just didn't know it. There wasn't as much fighting and killing and carrying on as it is now. We, we got along with the neighbor's children. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'd have a little scrap, but it didn't last long. 
we'd be back playing in the next 30 minutes. Forgot all about it. And I had a very nice life after I got old enough to realize it. I thought my daddy was hard on me. <coughs> I was I was approximately 17 before I could go out at night. You didn't go out at night at an early age like they do now. And then I had to be home by 10 o'clock. If I didn't, he'd come looking for me. <laughs> Wanting to know what's going on. What, what are you doing staying out this late? But uh, now I see children out any time of the night. So I'm very happy. And I, I want to tell this. When I was a boy, I worked for Dr. Taylor down in there on South Broad, South Main Street. And he examined me and he told me that I had a healthy body. He said, if you will take care of your body, it's, it's not known how long you'll live. But he said, if you're going to abuse it, you're not going to live long. He said, you're going to listen to me? I told him, yes, I'd listen to him. He said, well, if you're going to listen to me, I, I'll tell you how to live a long time. <laughs> so I did listen. He would examine me about every six months and taught me how to live. He told me not to ever drink any whiskey and that kind of strong drinks. Because he didn't have to tell me that because I didn't like the stuff anyway. When I tasted it. I didn't like it, and I never did drink anything like that, and I never smoked. He told me not to smoke, although he smoked, <laughs> but he told me not to do it, and I didn't. So, so I thank God for Dr. Taylor. He helped me to be here today, I believe. Okay, Ms. Carr, let's go back to you and you tell us some more about uh, some of the experiences that you, and some of the civic organizations that you've been involved in here in Mooresville. You've been a very active citizen here in Mooresville. Well, just after, just since I've retired, um, I was asked to join the Human Relations short, very shortly after I um, retired, the Human Relations Commission. So I did. And we um, planned to be able to curtail any problems that might arise um, during a time of, of um, disagreement. But thankfully, we never had to act on any of those plans. And I believe that Mooresville is about the only, at that time, was, was the only city that still had uh, a pretty good working um, organization at that time. But since then, we, we're not getting together for meetings as much. So what exactly was the goal of the Human Relations Commission? Um, the goal was to al alleviate any racial Disagreement. disagreements, right. disputes. Right. Was this... So when, when, when did you get involved in, the, in this? Well, it was already in operation okay. many years before, and I was appointed to the board by the commissioners. Um, I don't remember, um, maybe about maybe 94, some, somewhere in that area, I became a member. Can you tell us how it was in school? How was it when you went to school? Was it like it is today, or was it different? No. Well, it it was a little above. Um, when I was in school, uh, students were obedient. 
and students worked. Teachers had the authority. But having been there myself on both sides of the fence, teachers have no authority today. And um, I think that's pretty much the problem. How did they discipline them? Well, you, you, you would get spanked. You had corporal punishment. <laughs> <laughs> corporal punishment was, was, was there. Um, and, but the teachers really didn't give you spanking unless you deserved it. At least I felt that anyone that I knew who got a pattern, it was, it was deserved. How about with you, Mr. Campbell? You said you went for a very short time early on before you came to Morrisville. How was school then? Well, it was kind of rough for the uh, colored children. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the proper equipment. The We didn't get any crayon or anything. We, did, we never saw full stick of crayon, no, none of them but me, because I worked over to school later on, I, I saw what it was. They would take the crayon off the blackboard in the afternoon and put it in a box, and take the old wore-out erasers and put them in the box, and put them in the basement, and each weekend they'd bring that up there for the black folks to use. And some of the children, I don't, in their life, I don't know if they ever saw a full stick of crayon. They thought it came in pieces like that. And we we used all the junk from the white schools, you might say. They'd bring the pure benches up there where they'd cut them up, cut the names on them, broke them up, battered up, then they'd put them on a truck and bring them up there for us to use. Now, did you, I, I, did you all both attend, did you attend Dunbar? What was Dunbar school? There wasn't no Dunbar when I went to school. I went up to the junction to the bird house. <laughs> I, I, oh, yeah, that's right. You told me about that. And I think the students of today would be find it interesting about the book situation. Did you did you have to buy books? Were they rented? Well, or? back in those days, you the black people didn't use the same books the white used. They taught us the stuff that was, wasn't even happening. They taught us that John Brown was an enemy to the black folks. And we were we were mad at John Brown. We just hated him until we grew up and we found out he was teaching us the wrong thing. John Brown gave his life for the black folks, but we didn't know it. Showing you how we were treated. And I it wasn't any of our books like the white children's books. They taught us a different thing. But you bought your books at the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you bought your own books at the drugstore. And where was Goodman Drugstore? Goodman Drugstore was on the corner at um, the square. Santa's. George C. Goodman mm -hmm. ran that, and he lived on this spot. Mm -hmm. And how about for you, Miss Carr? How was it when you went to school? Uh, sometimes uh, we rented our books, and sometimes we didn't, but they were not usually new books. They were books that had come from the white schools and had already been used and some of them were not really in good condition. But um, we we used them anyway. Um, there was very little, if anything, in there about uh, black history or African American history. But we had good teachers, um, and and they told us uh, they taught us black history, um, perhaps from their own books. They would they would uh, give us the information. Was Professor Woods at the school when you were there? Yes, he he was there. Tell us about him. Um, he was. Yeah. Um, when I entered school, Mr. Woods 
Jesus was the principal. So I had him through my entire school career. Um, he was encouraging. He wanted us to do the best that we could and all that we could um, to be able to be contributors to the community and to the world. So he, he was really encouraging to, to the students, but he expected you to work, which was what we were there for anyway. So uh, he didn't, um, at least I didn't get by with anything. I was, I was too afraid because if, if you did it at school, uh, you got punished at school, you get punished at home. So you just try to do the right thing. This being Black History Month and with the passing of Mrs. King, what or how do you feel like all the movement has helped in Mooresville? How has it made a difference to you personally? Um, I know there's been such a great focus on this. Martin Luther King Jr. and his family. And I just wonder how you feel like it's affected you in Morrisville. That may be an unfair question too, I don't know. <laughs> you don't want to answer, you don't have to. <laughs> Being a, a smaller town, we we don't we have not had um all of the distractions that the larger cities have had, but we we have had some. Um, we we and there have been times when we have known that um, there was unfairness, mm -hmm. but we have learned tolerance. And, and we were taught, don't just fly off the handle. Think about it. And maybe you can come up with something uh, that you may be able to use to curtail it or to stop it. Uh -huh. But there, there have been some, some situations maybe that were not treated as uh, fair, dealt with as fairly as they could have been. But um, I have not personally had many uh, had situations like that because uh, there were times you, you uh, there were businesses if you wanted to purchase especially cafes, you would go to the back, um, the African Americans would go to the back door, but the whites went in the front. But my parents never allowed me to do that. They, I was not allowed to do that. If you can't purchase from the front, don't, don't you dare purchase anything from that business. And, and I never did. I, I just never used the back door. I did without. Mm -hmm. It was. It meant more to me to do without it than it did to have it if I had to go to the back door. Are you old enough to remember when the women couldn't, black women couldn't try on a hat? No, I, no, I don't you remember try that. On shoes. I don't remember that. You don't remember those days. Because I used to go, uh, a friend and I used to stop, we used to go in Carpenter's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the shop, and, and the lady had the most beautiful hats. We'd, we'd go in there and try the hats on. So. Well, you're not old enough. Well, back when I was coming along, <coughs> a black woman just had to go in there and buy a hat. For figuring where it was fit or not. You better not put it on. If you put it on, you had to buy it where you wanted it or not. 
and black people couldn't try on shoes. When my daddy would go to town to buy our shoes, he'd take a stick and measure inside the shoe. That was the way, the way he picked the shoes, because if you put them on, you had to buy them. And I guess I'm going back beyond your day. <laughs> but, yes, you are. <laughs> I, but this is, I think, I, needed for history. I think we need to know this. I remember I went in a shoe store there on the corner and uh, told a man I wanted to pair of flourishing shoes. And he said, no, you don't either. I said, well, I do. He said, no, here's the kind of shoes you buy. He got some down on the shelf. I said, I don't want those things. He said, well, you're not able to buy no flourishing shoes. At that time, a flourishing shoe cost $10. And uh, the average shoe ran around 3 and $4. If anybody wore flushing shoes, they had to pay $10, and didn't many people buy those shoes. But I wanted me a pair, and I had the money. He didn't want to sell them to me. Finally, his son came back there and sold me a pair. He wouldn't do it. Say, you don't need them. Here's the kind of shoes you need to wear. And uh, if I called his name, probably you all would know his son, so I'm not going to call his name. <laughs> He's dead now, but you would have known he hadn't been dead at all. But those are the kind of things that we came to. After I was married, I went to a store to buy groceries. And a uh, man that was counting my groceries, thinking how much I owed him. A white woman came and laid her groceries on the counter. He pushed mine back and stopped counting them, took hers, counted hers, and got the money, then went back and got mine and counted it, told me how much it was. I stood there until he got it counted and told me how much it was, and I turned around and walked out and left it all laying there. <laughs> and he, he said, you better come back and get this stuff, or I'm going to call the police. I said, well, you call the police, but I'm not going to take it. And I walked on out the door. Those are the kind of things that happen to black people in those days. I remember they were standing down at the railroad station and they'd go in the cafe in the back door back then and buy sandwiches and stand out on the platform and eat. You couldn't eat it on, in the kitchen even. Get out on the railroad platform and boys and girls be standing out there eating. I never did. I was like you were talking about. I'd eat sardines before I'd do it. So I'd go to the grocery store and get me a can of sardines if I was hungry. I wasn't going to eat that. Stuff like that. But people did do it. And Mr. Nat Johnson that ran the ice plant down there, he said, I'm just tired seeing this going on. He said, somebody's going to build a, some kind of place for the black people to eat. He said, if you don't want them to eat with you, at least you can build a place for them to go up to eat by themselves. It's just a disgrace to stand out on this platform eating. And from that day, they built places. Well, my uncle had a cafe right there at the railroad station, but it was in the basement. There's a big basement under that place. Under the depot? No, the building next to the depot. And uh, you know, that, that, that depot wasn't there then. It was a wooden building at that time. Well, that's, that's the news the new station. <laughs> no, you, you, I wish I had a picture of the one that had the back the time I'm talking about. But it still had the sign up there, white and black, like this one. Well, you certainly had lots of memories. and. and we appreciate you sharing this with us. We really do, because I think this is so needed to, for people to remember how far we have come. And thank goodness we've come this far. Mm -hmm. And I, I can remember when uh, you go in uh, the store uh, to buy clothing. And if you were black, the clerks would follow you. And I'm a, I've always been a, a looker. I like to just look around before I decide what I'm going to buy. And I would just say, I remember this uh, 
Sorry, Captain. You've got to follow me like you think I'm going to steal something. Then I'll just go to another store. And after that, and this was at Bell's. And after that, <laughs> I'd go in the store and I left. And after that, they would say, well, she likes to look. <laughs> Very good. Since we've progressed to, to where we are today, I would like for you all to just talk a little bit about how it was downtown Morrisville. I know we have changed the look of downtown Morrisville with the various stores, as well as we have progressed out 115. And how Morrisville is just boomerang. So can you talk a little bit about how it was and how you have seen the changes come in town? I think they've taken away so much of our history downtown. And there used to be three movie theaters here. And then, you know, you think, why three? But there were three. But um, the blacks could only attend, uh, could only go to the state. And you went in the balcony. And you went in the balcony. But it was better than Statesville because I went, well, maybe I shouldn't mention Statesville. But you had to go to the, I couldn't believe it. Um, you went up the fire escape. You, had to go you went to the, the balcony and you had to go around to the, the back side and go up the fire escape. I, I just well, it, it looked like fire escape <laughs> with metal steps. <laughs> but they were on the there. outside. It was metal steps like fire escape. But they were on the outside. <laughs> that was the stable. Yeah. And you had to go up high too to get in there. I didn't like it of any of the theaters because there were so all kinds of rats and chances and everything else up there. I didn't go. I would get anything on you. <laughs> I couldn't take it. And uh, I always went to Salisbury. That wasn't much better, but it was a little better. You still had to go upstairs, though. You didn't sit with the white people. But you know, you knew our parents were particular. Uh, whatever you wore there, you took it off before you went in, you know, with everything else. Those clothes had to be washed. Um, so they put that out there. Oh, yes. What do you feel like, um, as, as you have seen Morrisville Grove? But as we expand, can we continue to have our relationships in a good positive way? I feel like it's all progressive. Positive. You say, are we building or can uh, we build? Can we build? Have we built it? Can we continue to build? We're doing much better. Yes, things are much better. If you look back, even a few years, things have changed. They are so much better, but they are not what they should be. It's a long way to go yet. Do you have some suggestions, some suggestions for the people that we can continue to improve as we go along? What are some suggestions that you would make based on your past as that we can continue with the future? Well, the uh, only thing I ask for is just to be treated like a human being, like a man. And uh, so many places you're not treated that way. Still today? Yeah, even till today, yes, in Mosul. And uh, I feel that I'm as good as anybody. I don't care who it is. We're all human beings. God made us all. And that's the way I see life. And I'd like to be treated that way. And I do treat people that way. No doubt about that. I treat people that way. And I'd like to be treated that way. But I'm not in their own cases. But the majority of them are doing much better. I must admit. I, I hate to uh, go back to this, but Troutman is the best 
this town I have ever been in. And I believe you said that's where your business was. Yeah. I stayed there 59 years, and I was treated as nice as anybody in the city limits of travel. I don't care who it was. Treated like a human being. That's all I wanted. But there are some people in the world who are hard to deal with. But thank God they're not all that way. I feel that the majority of the more people are doing better. Well, I I know that Mooresville has changed, um, and it continues to change. But as Mr. Campbell has said, all I want is respect, and all of the other may just go away. And I'm I'm sort of a kind of person who demands respect. <laughs> if you don't give it to me, I, I know how to cut you off. But um, I think that's all any of us are looking for. We, we, it's, it's just respect and fairness. Um, and if you don't uh, give it to me, I, I know how to, as I said, to cut you off. You showed that when you went to bed. Well, we had, <laughs> we had one white woman who lived in Mooresville, very wealthy people. And this, she, this man's daughter said, if they're going to be Negroes in heaven, I, I don't want to go. I'll go on to hell. I was just a little boy. I said it under, I, I didn't say it out loud. I thought, I thought it, rather. I thought, well, honey, if you go to hell, there'd be Negroes there, too. <laughs> well, I think we must mention Mr. Campbell's book. May I show them the cover? Uh, Mr. Campbell has written this book, From Slavery to the 21st Century as Seen Through the Eyes of a Grandson. A very good book, and I would recommend uh, being checked out of the library, being read. So that's okay, is there anything else that we would like to add to our meeting? You know, I, I just, I'm so thankful for my parents, although they were not uh, very highly educated. They knew what I needed, and they uh, made sure that I got it. And I am so thankful for that. I, I can remember um, people, the people that my parents would work for and we'd be going to the beach and they would save money to send me someplace else mm -hmm. like um, uh, D.C. or New York and that way I was really getting an education. You were getting exposed to other things. I, that's right. That exposure mm -hmm. was giving me such a, a great education. Mm -hmm. And as my children came along, I did the same thing. I stayed at home, but my parents were still able to go on vacations there. They were in good health and, and, and all, and they would go, and I'd always send my children. Mm -hmm. So they would take them. I can't go, but I can, I can send my boys so they got the All exposure. Right. Right. Yes. Well, I want to say thank you so much for your coming and your sharing, sharing your thoughts, because that's so important for history. And I know that it may not have always been easy, but, but we appreciate your telling your stories and your candor. Yes. Thank you so much.